Thank you, Otto. No problem. Yeah. All right, we're good. Okay, so, so welcome everyone to our uh, Pastel Society of Southern California interview with uh, the esteemed artist, Lorenzo Chavez. We're really uh, thankful that you're here with us today, Lorenzo. Uh, I'm Chris Stillians, Vice President of uh, Exhibitions for the Pastel Society of Southern California. And uh, Lorenzo has just finished judging our second annual Make Your Mark Show uh, International Online Open Exhibition. Um, we are here to discuss the top five pieces and uh, how Lorenzo came to uh, focus in on those five pieces, how he established his uh, decisions. Um, but before we do that, I want to thank our three jurors, Isabel V. Lim from Hong Kong, and Diana Ponting from Canada, and Niall O'Neill from Ireland. Uh, uh, they were charged with scoring 364 images, paintings, and uh, it was not an easy task, I'm sure, considering the level and uh, range of all the artists and, and the work that they submitted. I'll yes. just, I'm, just say, I'm sorry, Chris. I just want to say, you know what? It was, it really was. It was, um, it was one of those. It, it was incredible work from all around the world. Um, by the way, I want to say I, I, again, thank you to all the, the jurors. This is the first time that we have international jurors, and um, we're really, really pleased with yeah, the selection. Awesome. So it was. I can imagine. I'm glad. I'm glad I didn't have their job. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I didn't have your job either. Uh, they they, <laughs> they had a tough job. It, they, but I tell you, that was they did a terrific job. It's a it's a going to be a fine looking exhibition. You know, kudos, hats off to everyone that entered and was brave enough to to submit work for this. You know, I know it can sometimes be a little daunting or frightening to enter, but I, I admire anyone that does that and I respect that. So I'm glad to see so many enter this show and, you know, it's turned out it's going to be a very fine exhibition. So congratulations to you all. Thank you. Well, we're, we're really, really honored to have you here, Lorenzo. I, I, you're coming Thank in you. from uh, Denver, Colorado, and, uh, uh, you know, that's where we're, uh, you reside now for how many years? I'm sorry. How, I'm you sorry. been studying in Colorado for how long now? We've been in Colorado now for, well, I originally moved to Colorado back in 1980, and then uh, we moved away for about five years, and I, I lived in Eugene, Oregon. Oh, wow. For five years in the early 2000s, and then we moved back here, and I've been here now 17 years oh. back in the Denver area, oh. so uh, we must like it here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, uh, well, yeah, thank you once again. I'm gonna let Chris. Uh, I'm gonna let Chris take over now, and uh, I'll, I'll just I'll be your tech guy. But if, I'm I'm here if you need me. Thank you, Otto. Appreciate okay. it. No problem. And I'm sure it was not easy because Lorenzo had to whittle down his decisions from 145 entries that the jurors juried into the the show. So his job wasn't easy either. And uh, we're going to uh, we'll get to his decision making process in a minute, but uh, we want to acknowledge Lorenzo's accomplishments and get a little history about him and his passion for pastels. Um, so maybe you should give us a little background into that at this point, Lorenzo. Just tell us, how, how did you d get into pastels initially? Do you remember your first experience? I, well, I kind of do. I mean, do you want the long story or the short story? <laughs> or the medium story? <laughs> the short story. We got a lot, we got a lot of stories I could, I could share, but uh, I'll try to, let's see, going, going back that far, wow, that goes back quite a ways. I think, I, think I, I definitely became familiar with Pastel when I moved here to Denver. Um, I grew up in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and I moved up to Denver in the late 70s to go to the Colorado Institute of Art to train as a graphic designer. So I moved up with that purpose. And I know during the training, during my education, we had a period where we experimented with different mediums, watercolor, acrylic, ink, pastel. And so we had to go out and buy materials for these uh, experimentations with the mediums. And that was, I know, the very first time I used pastel and touched it and that might have been the 1980s or like 1980. Um, 
and uh, used it for illustration projects early on. But uh, I just remember, uh, this is what I recall very vividly about pastel. It reminded me of this childhood memory. When I was a kid in New Mexico during like the autumn days when it was sort of semi-cool and I wanted to get warm, I would lean up against our wall or our, the wall at our home, which was an adobe wall. And we had sort of a dirt backyard and I would put my hands in the dirt and feel the kind of the sand in my oh. fingers. And sure. the first time I touched pastel, you know, years later, when I was, well, I was 20 at that time, it just brought me back to that moment where I felt that, you know, that sensation wow. again. And I, I've never gotten rid of that feeling. It's just a, you know, you just, I, it was instant love. Love at first touch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's and, where and, all the, those pigments come from the earth anyway, right? Exactly, exactly. But that sort of, you know, that beautiful grittiness that only the, past, the pastelists know and, and appreciate that feeling of that object in our hands and what a, a beautiful sensation that feels. And hopefully it is. It, I, I think the ones that love using it, they feel that same way. There, there must be some connection right. to that. Um, so that's kind of where my first experience with pastel came from. Um, at the art school I went to, um, Doug Dawson used to actually teach occasional classes. And Doug was, uh, the Denver area had a lot of very well-known uh, pastel painters. There was a gentleman by the name of Ramon Kelly. Uh, you know, one of my classmates, Desmond O'Hagan, was at the at the school. Uh, you know, he, we, we sort of, and they were very inviting and very accepting of the pastel medium in the Denver area. So it was easy to feel like it was a medium you could continue using. You know, I, I never got, you, you hear some people sometimes say, boy, should I work in this medium or that? What do people want kind of thing? What, what's more accepted? But right. Denver was always very, they're very open to that medium. The, the com Once I got into the commercial galleries, I never... I never saw any resistance in terms of wanting to use that medium. Um, sure. So that's that's one yeah. of my early memories. I, I, know you're, I know you're renowned for your um, depictions of the American Southwest, and I understand that you paint in oil as well as pastel. Can you give us some insight into maybe similarities or differences between those two mediums? What are your thoughts about that? Sure, sure. So uh, as far as sort of, I like to, put everything down to what I consider the visual language. So everything relates to shape, value, edge, uh, line, texture, pattern, and, and color. And whether, whatever medium you use, we're all sort of using this visual language to create work. And so there, the similarities are very similar across the board with all the mediums. The, the difference are the tactile, the, the tactile, sort of qualities that uh, oil gives you versus pastel. But, but I think the, you know, the thought process uh, in terms of creating a good composition and, and fine quality mark making all is very similar and relates very much, uh, you know, across the board with watercolor, oil, pastel. It's, it's just, you know, what, I, I, who was it? I think it might have been Ramon Kelly. And he said, you know, the only the oil painting, all you're doing is getting a brush with hair on it and putting it in this pigment, this wet pigment, you know, where pastel, you're just picking up that, that now it's a piece of solid pigment that you can kind of move around on the board. But uh, what's, what's your, once you've done that, then you're, you're sort of, you're, you're the, what's it called? The transportation system is, the brush or the fingers to put the pastel on. So uh, I find there's, there's, there really wasn't a, you know, there's some technical issues when you first might be switching from one medium like oil to pastel, you know, that you get used to, but I, I find you quickly kind of overcome those if you focus on the visual language. Um, so I hope, I don't know if that, that's a long answer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great answer. I, I like your, uh, your, your uh, analogy between two different mo mediums of transportation, but you kind of end up in the same destination, really, right? Exactly, I mean, exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. So one of the other profound things with pastel that happened, because I was an oil painter primarily, uh, 
for years, except for the occasional pastel with my with my illustration work or just trying pastels. Uh, so I, I took a uh, class at the newly formed Art Students League of Denver. This was about mid eighties. And uh, one of the classmates happened to be Terry Ludwig. Uh, oh, he's the famous pastel maker. He was in the class and we got to get know each other very well. And, and one of the things he really recommended uh, that I do as an oil painter was to do these color charts that they have uh, the students at the American Academy of Art do. And Terry was a student at the American Academy of Art in Chicago. Uh, so he said, you've got to do these color charts where you take each, each color on your palette and mix it with white. And then you mix it with every other color and you sort of get this big layout of colors. You know, you basically are mixing every color on your, on say your nine color oil palette. Once I completed that project, I had the, the charts laid out on my studio floor and I looked at them and I thought, oh my gosh, that looks like a pastel set. You know, oh, when you see the charts, yeah. they, the, all, the colors, you know how they are in the sets are all sort of divided by value and, and, and chroma sure. and all this. And so that I, what it did, instead of getting me interested in doing more oils, I completely quit pastel for 25 years, because I thought, boy, if I could have a set that was already pre-mixed, and at this time I was also getting into plein air, so it was like, boy, a preset mixed thing of color that I could take outdoors, boy, that's pastel. And so I dropped oil like a hot rock, <laughs> hot potato, <laughs> and, and devoted the next 25 years to working solely with pastel, uh, thanks to Terry Ludwig <laughs> in those charts. Cool. Oh. That, that's why you need that blue earth set right <laughs> yeah exactly that's exactly, that's exactly there. <laughs> that it looks exactly like those color charts um, yeah awesome okay um so oh yeah um Oh, you got the, okay, so many, let's, uh, many questions to get into some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll try to keep it short. I know. <laughs> no, 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 we're fine. No, no, we're fine. Okay. No, 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 this is great. I mean, this is really, really neat to get some nice insight and in your relationship, like, with, you know, with Terry Lovig and, and all these, you know, it's, it's, it's neat. And, and the fact that in similarity, similarly, is that I had my first experience with pastel using uh, using it for illustration so i did illustration jobs really? and, and I got, yeah I, you know i would grind it down with a little bit of baby powder and, and i would use a makeup applicator and, and we use it on film to create you know these really neat um uh car illustrations you know oh, and along with cool. marker right? so i but i never really had you know any pastel know-how until i met diana Pani, who incidentally was one of our our jurors uh and wow. i had my first class with her i believe that was back in 2012 and I never wow. look back. I just love, absolutely love pastel. So, yeah. you know, this, the fact that we're using it for illustration was, was uh, I was like, oh, no way. So That is so uh, yeah. neat. That is so neat. It's, it's, yeah, it's fun to see how we sort of just, you know, the pastelists take to it like water, you know. I mean, yeah. we just, once you touch it, you either love it or you don't. It doesn't seem like there's a a medium there. It's either love or, or hate. Right, right. <laughs> pastel. Right, yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, I, I absolutely love it. Um, oh, so, Lorenzo, you've been yes. uh, teaching workshops since 1993 all around the country and the world, probably for that matter. But um, what is it? What is it about teaching that you've continued to do it for so long? I mean, obviously, you must enjoy it. And what about the COVID-19 situation? Have you thought about teaching online? And um, on what do you think of online courses? We kind of touched on that earlier. What are your thoughts yeah. about that? Yeah, well, I'll start with the the teach. Why well, I got into teaching, you know, it's it's. Uh, uh, at the time I started, I was already showing in. I had started showing in galleries when I was twenty five. So I started teaching when I was about thirty three. So I was already showing, and uh, actually, an, another artist that I respected had recommended me to this workshop facility in Aspen, Colorado. So I taught my first yeah. workshop up in Aspen, and I was terrified. You know, it's like holy cow, I. Uh, it's I'm gonna fail so bad. This is gonna be so you know they're gonna figure out that I don't know anything. <laughs> and, uh, so I, in fact, I I I have a good friend. Uh, he took that very first workshop, and he still 
jokes to, to me about the way I was shaking in my boots the first demo I did, and I really was. I was, I thought, man, I'm going to fail miserably. But uh, so I stuck with it because I, I felt that there was something about the dialogue, you know, between what we do in the studio and what we share verbally. And I felt it strengthened the concepts uh, that I felt were sort of in my head and in my studio work. By, by verbalizing, I felt that they just sort of solidified and I, I saw more clearly by having to actually have to discuss it with, with other people. So it, it just sort of became a very intriguing thing to do. And I, I think I might have started doing maybe, I think I did one workshop the first year, the next year maybe two, you know, and then just continued, continued uh, doing it. Uh, and I feel very lucky that there's been an audience and people have been interested in wanting to take them. And uh, I started teaching plein air because that was uh, what I felt was for a landscape painter. That's what someone had to do if they wanted to become better. So I, and I feel that same way today. I feel very passionate about that's the way to learn landscape. And so, um, yeah, it, it was the introduction into pastel workshop. So I've been doing it, you know, pretty much across the country and, uh, and I haven't gone to Europe. I know you mentioned Europe, but I have not taught a, a workshop yet over, overseas. Uh, but almost every state in the U.S. I've taught. Uh, so I'm looking forward to someday maybe awesome. doing something overseas. But uh, so, co you know, what? one of the things, co I mean, COVID is a whole new situation, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's where we're, it's, a, it's a challenging time for all, all everyone concern you know everyone. Um, everyone everyone so we're all challenged in having to relearn things and i mean what we're doing today what a new experience uh and um, <laughs> exactly. yeah and so it's it's definitely uh, the learning curve has been extremely high and fast in the last five four or five months for us all uh so what happened with a lot of the workshops and i think a lot of the the people who travel the workshops were canceled. You know, the fear of traveling to places, they sort of had to cancel. So I, I think uh, most of my workshops, I tend to do them out of state and uh, they sort of just came to a standstill. Um, so I, I have in the last three years been teaching locally with the Art Students League of Denver. And I've been teaching a plenary class during the summer months and then during the winter months, I do an indoor uh, live class. So uh, this, uh, I think we started in April, I started teaching a live plein air class with only five students. Typically I have 10, 12 students in the class. We go out to locations and, you know, social distancing isn't an issue at all. Uh, we wear our mask when we're together for demos and when we have group discussions and, and Otherwise, they're at a distance and they, they can take their mask off. And, and when I come up to them to talk to about their work, we put our masks on. So it sort of worked out that way. Um, it's the, the strangest thing is for since 1993, one of the issues with plein air painting is whenever people wanted to paint, uh, they would, I would tell them, you know, Okay, we're gonna we're in a class. Let's try to stay together so you can get more individual attention. You know, just stay together, and everyone just scattered to the four corners. <laughs> so I mean, for a plenary painter, for a plenary teacher, you know, you're walking. You're spending a lot of time walking oh, yeah. to places. So this this is the first time that now I'm actually telling people to scatter. Yeah. To, to, to yeah. stay stay their distance and I, I find that's helping and and I find that people are finding it very restorative to be outdoors you know set up an easel be out in the fresh air small group they feel yeah. safe I think they feel a sense of normality by being outside and I think that's been restorative in a way and I I, I know it is for me, and, and I, I know I'm getting that feedback from the students that are in the class. Uh, the thing, I'm doing it locally, so mo most of my students go home at the end of the day, you know, because they go back. We, I live in the Denver area, so there's a, a big community of artists in the area. 
So um, I highly recommend if you have, I know you live in a big community, but if you have people that are willing to teach plein air and open spaces there, you know, that, that might be the ticket for a little while, sure. uh, for plein air classes anyway. Uh, yeah. Online, you know, that was a good question. I get asked that a lot recently because, you know, a lot of the workshops want to do online. Um, and I've been having discussions with it with my wife, you know, and when I'm when I'm outdoors and I'm painting with this small group and primarily I love painting plein air and teaching plein air. Um, and you're outside and you feel the wind rustling in the trees, the birds chirping, the creek. Yeah, you know, how do you rep how do you replicate that? You know, it's yeah. it's uh it's I, I wrote down a little thing here that that you know it you, you just can't get that that essence, that, that spirit, that it's such a, it's a, a sense, it's a sensual all around experience. You feel the sun on your back, you know, and that's, that's something you just can't reproduce via the, the, you know, online classes. I, I know there's other aspects that we can teach and I, I'd be happy to share those aspects, but I think one of the things with, with, landscape painting in, in outdoors is it's really about the whole feeling and being there on the spot and sure. watching the sun change and watching the shadows change and that's that's what makes it exciting for me to to be there and witness that with people and talk to people while they're painting so um that being said though if things you know i may end up doing some online uh classes just because uh you know i see there's a need for them uh, so I, a long answer. I hope that yeah. oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> you must have that first workshop you did. You must have had some interesting textures in your strokes from all that shaking in your boots. You did. <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I was a nervous wreck. It was, uh, <laughs> okay, I, let's, yeah, uh, yeah. Let's get into our exhibition a little bit here. Sure. here. Um, did you have a kind of a checklist of sorts when you were judging the work of other artists does it, and how does that apply to your own work and and uh what are your thoughts about that how did you what was some of your thought processes there yeah yeah so um you know when i when i jury the show um i like to imagine i'm walking into a, a gallery space which i've been doing for years or a museum and i walk around and just absorb the work uh, in this case, it was online, so I, I kind of look, look at the images, but I imagine I'm just sort of, I, and I scroll through them, look at them, and do several, I call it walk-arounds, but in this case, I'm looking at the uh, images several times as I'm, as I'm looking at the show, because, you know, I, I want to be open-minded and kind of come to it with kind of what, what starts to become visually interesting to me. And that's, that's when I go into what, what, what I kind of teach in my workshops, which is uh, dealing with the visual language, you know, and I, I can break down a painting to the essential elements. Um, there's a, I set this book aside. There's a great book. I don't know if you're, is that backwards for you when you see that? Oh, you, okay, it's, it's called good. A Visual Palette by Kevin Weckback. He had studied with Quang Ho. It's a great, it kind of describes this process and, and what this book describes, and I find this is something we learned in art school, but it, it, it helps us to kind of dissect our paintings and, and what, what qualities we can kind of individually work at to improve. So the visual elements for the painter are shape, value, line, edge, texture or pattern and color. And that's essentially what we use. You know, whatever, whatever tool we're using for a three-dimensional, I mean, a flat painting, that, those are essentially our tools. Um, and what I try to do in my workshops is I get people to start to think in these, to, to describe a scene using the visual language. So, you know, when I go out there, I say, I don't want you to say, there, oh, I see a tree or a, a creek i want you to say there's a green large shape you know with soft edges next to a smaller green shape and what it does is it changes our visual perception mentally and we start thinking abstractly 
And when we're in that sort of zone of abstract thinking, we can start to see things in a visual way, a creative way. And so I use that same tool for my own work in plein air and in the studio. Uh, no matter what subject, I try to break it down to these visual things like shape. You know, we could take that and you could spend a whole, you know, year just focusing on getting better shapes. Uh, you know what? Just variety of shape, uh, large shapes, small shapes, the varieties of sizes. Um, think of the painter Pete Mondrian, you know, the guy who did the squares. You know, that was, oh, yes. that was definitely a line and shape painting, right? And it's very simplicity. It's just... It was just large squares and small squares, lines that all kind of were dissecting the composition in different ways, uh, dividing that pictorial space in several different ways. So there was un uniqueness to all the shapes. So whether it's a complete abstract painting or that painting becomes a highly representational painting, it all boils down to that foundation of how those elements are working to create quality. And so when I'm looking at a show, I look for those elements. I'm looking for, you know, are the shapes interesting? Is there variety in the sizes? Is there, are there a contrast in values? You know, or is there unity in values? Is there line quality that's being used? Uh, in terms of keeping your eye moving around the pictorial plane, um, edges. You know how how does the artist how does the artist help lead the viewer around the painting with the use of uh, edge mastery? Uh, texture and pattern relates to you know our mark making and how we move the eye that way or how we create unity with textures. Uh, and in color, I mean, that, that, I sort of save colors last because I think that's, that's an element that I find a lot of people have their own color sense. And I, in my teaching, I tend not to kind of step too much on that except for basic concepts like working with uh, analogous colors or complementary colors or tr staying true to nature, you know, what our eye visually sees in nature. Um, but uh, Color is definitely one of the more important aspects, but uh, I think it's something to kind of kind of keep in the back burner till closer to the end. That's that's kind of what the old masters did when they worked in kind of Grisaille paintings or, or or value painting studies before they creeped up to color. Uh, today we tend to jump right into color, which is which is fine, but uh, uh, I, I find it's a, it's a highly interesting and, and you know, uh, area of the painting process, but definitely, uh, you know, so that essentially when I came to the exhibition and I was looking at the works online, you know, I first look at thumbnails and then I look at them larger and then I look at them full screen. I'm scrolling through them and I'm just sort of taking it in uh, as if I'm walking around a gallery and then finally something hits me visually like, boy, that, you know, that's really strong. And you can usually pin it back to those visual elements, why that's working. Um, then there's the, I would say that's a major component of what makes the work successful. But then there's that added, I would say 50% of the painting's success is that love that the artist brings to the subject, loves the love that the artist brings to the me medium. And that comes through, you know, and you see that combined with the visual elements and that love of subject that kind of rises the level of the quality up to a whole, whole nother plane. And, um, and you can see, I think with the love comes the confident mark making and, you know, that also comes with experience, but it also, uh, you know, it's part of that quality building in work. So, I, so as, as I'm looking at a show and kind of looking you know, at what's really working in terms of uh, quality, th those are the aspects I use. And um, I, at this point, I, I feel, you know, I like to use them in my own work and it helps me grow as a painter to, to study other artists' works, uh, today's contemporary artists, as well as the artists of the past, you know, and kind of find that common link to these visual elements and find that link in terms of 
the passion the artist brought to it. Um, so long, yeah, that's the, that's the long answer. Hope well, that's, that. a, that's a great answer because you pretty much just answered my next two questions. Oh, I did, you. okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good, yeah. I was gonna ask you, um, you know, as an impressionist painter, how do you, do you find it um, hard to judge other kinds of work, but you just, you just said it's really, doesn't really matter what kind of painter you are. It's the basic elements of all art that you are cognizant of, right? That's, that's one of the things. Exactly, exactly. Um, I mean, just to, just to kind of talk a little bit about that, why we fall towards a certain subject, at least for a while. I mean, you know, we can change. We all change in our lives and maybe we move on to a different style of working, but, uh, I, I often tell people they're not sure what style they want to work in. You know, I said, you know, when you go to, I tell them, when you go to an art museum, you know, what area of the museum do you find yourself gravitating to? You know, it's, it's, right. it's very clear. It's, it's, you know, it's like, uh, just like music, like what music are you, what do you gravitate to? Right. You, you can like all that genres, but there's one that maybe yeah. you just love a little more. And that's usually a sign that that's kind of what your passion is leading you towards. Uh, so impressionism was definitely since I was probably in middle school that was the area of the museum I would be drawn to um, and today I still am you know even though I go through the abstract section in the super highly realistic area and the uh, um, you know all I look at it all because you want to keep the open mind but I still find myself draw, you know and that's that's essentially what where our our style derives from we find we want to kind of emulate that style that we that we are are we find joy in right you yeah. relate to it. sure <laughs> um, so if you were um, going to give artists some of that that are maybe just starting out entering shows they're maybe new to, new to the medium or something it, what would your thoughts be about if they feel intimidated about entering a show? Maybe the 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 judge or the jurors painting a different style than theirs, and they're worried about that, or maybe they just don't have the confidence in their work, or they're intimidated by some. What are your thoughts? Of, what would you tell an artist about that? Yeah, that's that's a really good question because I get asked that, and I, I mentor some artists, and that's something we talk a lot about because that's that's another step in the process of painting you know, eventually we want to sort of show our works you know we we create in right. sort of a, in a way isolation but we also want it to be viewed and seen and so it's a little intimidating when one first takes that step and says let me let me enter it in a show so what helped me early on is i i started when i was really young i used to be a pretty avid fly fisherman fisherman so i look at you're entering a show as if I'm fishing, you know, you, I, I think I say, you know, you got to throw the bait out there. <laughs> and, and the, more bait, the more bait you have, the better, you know, throw it in the pond, in the pond you want, because you're specifically going after, but then you just got to let it go, you know, and, and whether you get a rejection or an acceptance, you know, it's, it's, there's another day you can try again. And I find that that helps to ease the, ease the, you know, making it so important that I've got to get accepted in this show. Yeah. Um, and you've probably all heard this, you know, an artist will say, I entered one and got rejected. The next show I entered, he won, I won the best of show. And that's, that's so true. Uh, the other advice I always give people is to, you know, shoot for the stars when they enter, you know, it's enter the, best exhibitions you can um, because you know that's going to feel that much so, so much better when you get that acceptance letter uh, yeah. than, than say maybe a, a small you know county fair or something which I did my share of <laughs> I did my share of but I I, I find it to be uh, well, like recently, I, I was sending works to galleries, and this kind of relates to sending the exhibitions. And I was okay. There was a list of five galleries, and I I had my list to like this is the best, the one I really would like, and then down the list. And so I submitted to all those galleries, thinking that I would probably never get asked by the better gallery. 
And all the other ones rejected me, and the best gallery said yes <laughs> to the. Oh. So, so, so it's, it's, you just never know. So I, I say just always, you know, put it out there, put it in the best uh, opportunity you can, uh, exhibition wise, and then just let it go. I think of it as like, you're just cast the fly and, and some days you're going to get a bite. Some days you won't. Perfect. <laughs> I hope, I hope that helps. Analogy. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that's great. You're full of great analogies. Man. That's oh, great. Yeah. Uh, I am full. I'm full of something for sure. <laughs> well, that's, the art, that's the artist in you. you know, that's the poet in you. That's great. Um, when you were judging these pieces, did, were there any pieces that were just really close? I mean, were you splitting hairs on anything or what, what, do you have any thoughts about that? Oh, yes. This, uh, you know, congratulations to all the artists. It was such a fine exhibition as I went through the whole 145 works uh, that had been whittled down, I understand, from the, the initial group. Um, very high quality, very high quality. So I think overall, it's going to be a very fine exhibition throughout. You know, to take uh, 15 out of the 145, what is that, 10 percent? Yeah, it's about 10%. It's about, yeah. 10%, which is a very small percentage yeah. that actually won an award. So what I typically do is I start to pull images off the screen. But if it was a live jury show, I start I would either put a tag next to it as I start to find the qualities I think kind of are rising it above the others in terms of the visual language that we discussed earlier. Uh, so with this, it was, it was hard. I mean, it, you get it down to 30. And then like, oh, can I whittle it down? I, I wanted to call you several times, like, can we get 30 awards? <laughs> yeah, can we get 25 oh, awards, you know, 20 we'll, awards? We'll, about get there. You know, we'll get there, we'll get there. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll, we'll keep working on we'll get, that. Every, yeah. every year, we'll just we'll try to get a few more awards, yeah? Right, right. So I, I you know, when you, when you do, when you're taking works and because you have a certain amount of awards one wants to give, you know, and you, it, it's hard. It's hard to place those in the, that category because I think of them as all winners, you know, in my mind, it's, I think they've won already the fact that they were brave enough to enter the show and they took the chance and gamble and, and here they are even got accepted in the show. That, that's a major, a major coup already. Uh, to win an award is, uh, is a, a added blessing, uh, you know, to the, to the overall package. Um, but it, as, as a, as a judge, it's, it's, a, it's humbling and daunting and, and uh, eventually I, you have to do it, you know, you have to sort of get it down to the number that, uh, equal to the awards that are, that are, uh, being given out. And, uh, and that's sometimes it is splitting hairs at that point. It's really sort of a matter of. I'm looking at them several times, comparing them. I had to put them all on one screen because, you know, if a live show, I typically would put them away and put them aside in a corner of the room and kind of start to look at them right. together before I start to figure out which awards go to who. So it, it's a long process. And then the little meditation between it, you know, going for a walk to sort of free my mind and vision and then come back to it with a fresh eye and, and, uh, but it's, uh, and what I find the strong works just visually have the, the elements that we talked about strong, those strong elements and they, they start to stay clearly in your mind, you know, just like when you hear a song that you just fall in love with the first time you hear it, it's just in your mind, it's in your heart already forever. And those, that's when you know those images are strong. Um, and I, and you know, uh, yes, all, all judges are going to come to it a little differently. So that's why you got to keep casting that, <laughs> casting that lure out. Right. And, you know, you just never know. You never know. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Lorenzo, for your insights. It was uh, really great yeah. hearing what your thoughts are. I think at this point we should maybe uh, talk about the uh, five uh, top awarded uh, images maybe starting with the fifth uh, place. Uh, sure. What are your sure. thoughts about that? Let's talk yeah, about that. Sure. So what we'll do is uh, give me a second here. I'm going to share uh, share my screen here, and we're going to go through uh, the images of the uh, your top five picks, Lorenzo. And okay, sounds great. Uh, 
right, so here we go. This is, uh, uh, this is and I'll, I'll, I'll give you, just let me pull my worksheet up here. Uh, this one is uh, specifically uh, the Holbein Sponsored Award. And uh, this piece, well, I'll let you go ahead, uh, Reza. Well, I, yeah, congratulations to Pamela Cook. It's a fine work. You know, as, as happens with a lot of the works that sort of uh, become the upper award winners, as you're looking at the body of work, there's elements that make it stand out uh, kind of in the crowd. Um, and uh, if we go back to the visual elements we talk about, you know, look at the three, look at the big, if you squint your eyes and you look at the three dark rocks, the three main rocks, you know, just on a pure, pictorial design, there's three unique shapes. Uh, I like to say the shapes are unique and specific. You definitely sense them, you see them. There's a wonderful placement of all of them. So there's a nice variety in where they sit in the picture plane. Uh, that sort of drew me in. It's, it's a very graphic piece. I like the idea of looking down on the subject. And then sort of seeing it almost as a, you know, if you looked at it as an abstract expressionist painting, it's got those qualities, yet it's got a representational idea, right? The rocks and the water and the flow, but there's so much beautiful energy to this. Um, I found that it had a great spirit to it. You know, I sense the artist just had a ball doing it, you know? And I love that. I love, just like, you know, when we see a musician playing a guitar and they're just having a ball, you just, you just love it, right? You can, I can sense the artist just having a grand time painting and, and, but you know, if we look at even the, the areas in the water, so you got the white foam with the water, but then the sort of lighter gray areas, if you start to look at the individual shapes, there's variety in each one. I mean, that, that takes a lot of mental uh, adjusting and skill to, to keep that variety fresh and, and yet have that variety be present. Um, so that, that was one of the outstanding qualities of this work. Uh, the, other, the other thing that really stood out was I love that, you know, they use a sort of gray green color harmony to hold it all together. You know, if you look at the greens, you know, just this goes to the color area of the visual language. Just start looking at the variety of greens from cool greens to warm greens. And there's a beautiful, they're very subtly done, but there's a beautiful uh, harmony that holds everything together with their cup with the color palette. Um, let me see, I, I yeah, I, I think it's it's got a poetic quality to it. And I just felt it was a very strong and unique kind of vision of this this subject. So congratulations, Pamela yeah. Cook. Way to go. All right. All right. Congratulations, Pamela. <laughs> All right. We could have gone fish in there. Was that, yeah, that's exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, we've got the, our next award is our uh, Isabel V. Lim uh, Henri Award. Uh, she was uh, one of our uh, international jurors. And uh, let me pull the image up here for you. Uh, just a quick second. And, um, and this award goes to none other than Carol Peebles. Yeah. Fantastic work. Congratulations, Carol. What a, what a beautiful piece. Uh, this, this piece, uh, again, you know, just, I, I like the pictorial idea of it, the, 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 the figure, the, the, the young girl looking away from us, which is daring, you know, looking at, uh, uh, somewhere else. Definitely something's on her mind. You, you get these, you know, we start to interject our own ideas in it. Uh, and that's always wonderful when, when your mind sort of travels and starts to create a, a story. Uh, but, I'm, but, you know, when we start to dissect what, what she's done here, you know, if you look at the overall value relationship, she's kept a very close value uh, uh, relationship going. The values are really highly close to one another, there's some separation, but if you squint down, they sort of almost blend into one another, except if you look at the face, which is lighter in value, that edge stands out strongly against all the other edges. If you squint down, this is what you wanna do. Some, one thing I do a lot in my 
workshops is I have people say, squint down at the subject, start looking at the contrast of light and dark. So you really see where she wanted your eye to go with that contrast, but the other values are more closely related. So there's, the, your eye tends to go right to her face, uh, just in terms of value. Uh, her color palette, very muted. Uh, it has a very subtle shifts of colors, but they're, they all relate. So there's a beautiful relationship of color harmony throughout the whole painting. Uh, but one of the fun things I found is once I start to study the edge quality, if you follow the figure from say the back, mm -hmm. the uh, lower back on the right side of the painting, just follow that line up along the edge and then go into the hair and then compare the value of the back to the hair. And then look at what happens with the edge quality there. There's a beautiful transition of soft edges, which gives a nice contrast to that hard edge. Uh, and then you follow the hairline is very soft. And then you come around to where the face is and get into the eyes. And then you hit another hard edge right around her eyes, her nose, her lips, very sharp edge with a lot of contrast. And if you follow that down, again, you go towards the left side of the painting and the edge there at the bottom left, you notice she darkened the value. So the value of the edge is very, uh, the value of the background is very close to the value of her, her, her top, her, her blouse. So if you squint down, it almost disappears, which, another, which is a beautiful, another way of controlling value, right? By putting two close values together, you lose an edge or the softening of edge next to a hard edge creates another beautiful edge. So just a masterful quality of edge control in this piece. So uh, bravo, Carol, just yeah. beautiful work. Well, and uh, moving on to uh, our third place award, which is our uh, PSSC uh, sponsored cash award, uh, and that award goes to. Yes. And the, yeah. I know this is going to be a tough one for us to pronounce. Yeah. Right? So we each have our, our take on, on the name, but I'll let you go first. <laughs> I'll let you go first. But the award goes to uh, to, uh, to taking a break, and uh, and I think, I and mean, please forgive us if if we if we don't pronounce this correctly, but I believe it's. Yael or, or Yael, Yael. my Yael. mom. Yeah, that that sounds right. We'll have to ask her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's a beautiful yeah. piece. It's a, yeah, it's a beautiful piece. So please, please, please forgive us if, if we mispronounced your name. Um, and and again, I'll let you uh, go ahead, Lorenzo, and, and, and uh, give us your take on, on, on this piece. Yes, well, congratulations to Yael. Uh, I, I just, I, right away, this hit me. It's a strong work with a lot of spirit, a lot of love to the subject. I, I sense her deep love to the subject. You, you just sense it in the, the eyes, you know, just, just in terms of, because we tip, typically come to a, 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 a representational subject with the pictorial idea, right? The, what is the imagery about? Uh, and it's powerful in that regard. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, we've been watching my son's cats for the last, during this COVID and so we've had the cats around, normally we don't, so it definitely struck a chord there too and we've had cats in the past, so there's probably some of that coming out, but, but in terms of pure technical mastery, you know, look at her bold, confident mark making. I mean, there is some guts there, you know, bam, bam. There's, there's some pure joy and guts and positivity in her mark making. Uh, which creates this representational object, but the the it's almost got an abstract expressionist uh, life to it. This quality of of, yeah. of dark light shape, you know, the color harmony, that sort of red green color palette, which is keeping everything in a uh, harmonic of uh, beauty, uh, and then of course contrast. Boy, she's taking you on the extreme journey of the darkest dark to the lightest light. And that's powerful when an artist can do that whole range and still make it work as a cohesive whole. Um, she's got, uh, you know, again, if, you, if we look at the edge quality, and remember, we're going back to that idea of the visual language. So there's always those key elements. Uh, if we squint our eyes at the subject, 
you know, and I'm squinting at the screen as I look at this. And I would squint at the originals if I was there. But you start to see the dark background on the right side just sort of melt into the, the, the head of the cat. Mm -hmm. You know, you just sort of just disappears into the background or comes out of the dark background. It's a beautiful, beautiful transition of nice edge control, very softly transitioning from, from one dark extreme into that bit of bright contrasting color around the cat's mouth and the, the, the neck and the top. There's some beautiful, strong marks that very, definitely she knows her anatomy and the, uh, the characteristics of the, the way the mark should be placed to suggest the anatomy. Um, let's see, I wrote down, she's got, uh, you know, it's, it's definitely bold and confident work. Uh, and you look at, if, if we follow the top edge of the cat, as you go, you know, you see this red square and it stands out, it jumps out. But if you squint your eyes down, yeah, yeah, you almost see it just blends into the background. That edge is beautifully handled with it's a change of it's a it's a color change and a, and the value is very close to the black. So pictorially, you sort of just almost glance past the red, but yet it holds you in in a powerful way as well. Uh, and then if you follow the edge of the back of the cat to where the hind legs are. I mean, she yeah. goes into pure abstract expressionist there. Yeah. So definitely uh, one of my favorite artists, Nikolai Feshin, who was a Russian artist right. who came to America, yeah. did this a lot where he had areas of extreme detail with abstraction and she does a beautiful job with this. You, you get that. The, the forward paw is described, but look at the paw behind it. It's It's purely, abstract so it really allows the viewer to kind of finish the painting which which is which is fun to do um, so you know bravo to you Kale. Yeah. Well, congratulations I, terrific I, I, work I, I, I agree I believe I mean it's just stunning how she fuses the background to, you know to the, the subject itself and one one merges with the other and I, I love that I love that with her. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah isn't that isn't that amazing yeah. it's, it's 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 very evident but when you squint down it's sort of just yeah falls back beautifully. <laughs> and, and what minimal strokes she uses to create the nose and the mouth structure and, and how one eye is just, it looks like it's just a stroke of black, but it, it's just so, so believable. It's just- it's, Exactly, yeah. I mean, it looked like it took her, you know, 20 minutes to paint it, but I know it probably took a <laughs> lifetime to get to that point, you know, but she, she's definitely a poet with her mark making. Uh, yeah, wonderful work. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful work, yeah. I, uh, I, I laugh because it takes me like 20 years to finish a piece, but um, yeah, <laughs> <yes>. <laughs> all right, well, uh, moving up, moving up um, in second place, uh, second place, uh, another stunning piece. Um, it is Carol Peeble once again, which I'm sure yes. this is going to yes. make very, very happy. Um, yes. Please give us, uh, please let us know what you, what, why, 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 uh, this piece now it, it, it's, it's a stunning piece, um, uh, but I want I'm curious because you know we 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 see uh, several artists uh, in, in different shows win a couple pieces and tell us why and, and, not, and I, I just want want to hear your take because mm -hmm. I mean they're right. really worthy pieces and this is where I'd like to get some insight as to um, was this one of those things where did you even have to split hair or did you just know instantly that these this piece was definitely in the top contention. De definitely, it hit in, in a very strong way. And, you know, it's de obviously very, very poignant to the times we're going yep. through Absolutely. here now. So his historical piece as well. Um, and I, you know, hats off to Carol for that. That that takes bravery. And I think that's a, a just, but, but what a tour de force in terms of the artistry behind it. You know, I mean, it's, it's the subject alone is, is, very moving and captivating, you know, but then it's, it's handled in a masterful way. So, so you can focus on the subject and less on the, the way it's, it's handled. But uh, as artists, you know, we all want to kind of deconstruct and find out how this is put together. So uh, the notes I wrote on her is it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's a bold statement 
you know, uh, bold in both because it relates, even her, her title, I think there was, you know, titles can have a powerful presence to it. And the title of this work has a, it's a strong title she picked for it, but uh, it's a bold statement. And, uh, you know, we're all going to come to it in our own way, how we see that statement, but it's definitely there. There's a bold statement for us to sort of let ourselves immerse ourselves in that and the ideas behind it. Uh, technically, you know, pow, that red against the, the dark uh, stop stoplight, mm -hmm. you know, the uh, traffic light, yeah. that's just like, pow, <laughs> bam, you know, it's, it, she's hitting the drums hard, wham, you know, she definitely is drawing your attention with that contrast of sharp edges, you know, if you look at the if you look at the left side of the the stoplight, you know the shapes, shapes yeah. really strong hard edges compared to if you keep going down that line of the gentleman's shoulder, you know, on the left side down his arm, and then just before it leaves the page, how it just softens that edge just disappears. So she definitely is controlling where she wants us to look, both in terms of contrast. Uh, and in terms of color, the shock of that red against that cool background, that cool gray background. So there's a shock in temperature right there. Um, but then there's also look at the left side of the figure. Uh, if you follow the from the stoplight, the red light on the top of the gentleman's head, where it's a it's a light value, but if you squinted it, that value kind of almost starts to disappear a little bit into the background until you get to the dark area of his head. And boy, that is a sharp, sharp line. Yeah. You know, compared to every other line, it, I think it might be sharper than this, the stop sign on the left side. Yeah. When I look yeah. at it, my eye just, and I thought that was very daring to put it on someone's back of their head as opposed to the front, you know, because typically that's what you'll see. You know, Rembrandt in his portraits, he would have added a really strong edge, right? A lot like the collar. He would have made it really bright and that contrast with a sharp edge. And But it usually was right around where the main area of the face was. Here she chose the sharpest edge right in the on the back of the head. So there's a that's a powerful way of visually moving you around. Yeah. Um, and, and then you go into, you know, so just a strong graphic design. Uh, and uh, what I'm looking at now, which I didn't, I wasn't able to see on the uh, online, was the size of the work. So this is really fun to now see what the sizes are. And at eight, at 24 by 18, that's going to be an impressive piece in life, uh, size-wise. Uh, but uh, if you start to go into now the artistry and the art mark making, you know, look look at the way she handled the back, those marks. Uh, you know, those, those mark making, I, I, I like to think of them as calligraphy, you know, the, the way you could just, you could sense the spirit of the artist and the marks being placed in the back, you know, just carefully thought out and placed very confidently, but very thoughtfully. And, and that's beautiful when you see that, you see the confidence of the artist coming through the, the assuredness of their medium, uh, and those all add to that quality. Um, look at the wonderful halo, halation she has. If you look at the shoulders, above yeah. the shoulders yeah. and in the back of the head, she's got this halation, that glowing light, which is a beautiful transition of color from, from the dark value to the warm halation to the cool background. Just a, It's a subtle, subtle thing, but really masterfully done so um and then I, I love how she put in the telephone poles and they're done very uh loosely very casually very you know uh almost almost uh obviously she wanted them to sit in the background so they don't they don't compete with anything in the main subject but but i like how she just sort of toyed with that sort of all very sketchy look against the very highly finished look of the head. It's, you know, Matt, just, just a tour de force. It, you know, uh, 
Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 you know, you mentioned the, the hard line on the back of his head. And yes. one, one of the first things I noticed about this piece um, when I saw it was that she, she used uh, a method that many classical artists use was to, to use these bold, dark shapes to give more form to that that they wanted the viewer to look at. Yeah. And so, you know, you, you look at the back of the head and how hard that is, and you, you see that stop like that bold uh, shape, and, and look how much form it gives to that that gesture in, the, in, in, in his face, you know, it just oh. it's so much more form. So it's almost like yeah. a placeholder, look at me, you know, and um, like I, I just thought that was stuff. That is amazing. Yeah. And, it, and it's, yeah, you can compare this to some of the old masters works and yeah, you see those qualities come through. So it's, it's fun to compare it, you know what, but yet it's definitely a, a painting of our times. That's right. uh, yeah. Uh, you know, congratulations, Carol. You just, yeah. you know, That's knocking him out of the park. Winner, winner of this year's uh, two, two top awards uh, for this exhibition. Two, two top yeah. awards. So congratulations to Carol. That's a yes. beautiful, beautiful pieces. Well, we have come up to our last, uh, other, by the way, that was also a uh, Pastel Society of Southern California sponsored award. Uh, and we're proud to give it to Carol Peoples for such a stunning piece. Um, and Perfect. our last award, uh, our first and our, our top winner, uh, we don't have a best of show since we don't have different categories, uh, but uh, so this is our, 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 top, our top dog here, so to speak. Great, So great. congratulations to Terry McMurray. Yay. Yay. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, this, this is one of those two. I, I, I think I, I mailed you a juror statement. One of the things I, when I look at a show, I, I look at all the work over and over again. And there's just works that continually just seem to get stronger each time you view it, you know, and that's one of the qualities you look for. It just, it just gets stronger and stronger and stronger. And this is one that, uh, it seems like a very simple concept, right? But when you put it together as a whole, one that's sort of looking down on the object, uh, the, the use of repetition of, of circular forms, to kind of move the viewer around is wonderfully handled. And I, and I love also, I don't know if the rim of the bowl was actually red or she changed the color to kind of harmonize with the uh, persimmons, right? Uh, right. But they, it, it just whole, ties together beautifully. So let's, let's go in again to those visual elements. So if we, let's just look in terms of pure line. So if we follow the branch from the right side of the painting in, you know, to me, that it allowed the viewer to kind of enter the painting through that area, you know, uh, and go into the interior of the bowl. And then the branch sort of took you into the center of the painting. But I love the way she continued the branch out to the edge of the bowl. And just, you could see the main branch, she just barely overlapped it, you know too much more and it might have shot your eye out of the painting you know but she just just enough to like give it that little edge over the the bowl yeah. but to keep you following that line so if you follow that branch and then start to follow the line of the um outer bowl that red circle and i love the way it sort of leaves the pictorial space and then comes back into it and then leaves it comes back in leaves it you know on the right side and then on the left side she's kept it completely inside the pictorial image the you know the outer four edges of the painting beautifully handled just my eye kept moving around it's a beautiful color relationship of reds and greens as well as warm and cool colors uh, now, if we start to look at the edge quality, look at the what she did with the cast shadow in the bowl mm -hmm. and just follow one of the things we did in art school that we used to when we did life drawing is our teacher said, when you're doing, we used to do these line drawings where you would start kind of put your pencil on the paper and follow the form with your eye, follow the figure with your eye and then just leave your hand on the drawing board or drawing paper and just continue to follow the form visually and just kind of let your hand move along the outer form. Is that making sense? Yeah. Uh, 
what what the way he described our teacher described it he says you want to imagine you're a little bug on the figure and you're just walking along the edge of that form so if you do that if you imagine you're just sort of walking along that edge of the cast shadow and then you start to really become very highly aware of how she's treated the edge quality where she went soft you know, as it gets closer to the edge on the left side, where she lost the edge on the upper right side. So she really contains the viewer with that contrast of edge control, uh, both in the cast shadow, but also within the persimmons. You know, there's beautiful hard edges, especially that one that is the furthest to the right side, and it's got that bit of bright light and sharp cast shadow on it. You see which one we're talking yeah. about? That, yeah. that has got to be one of the strong edges are you, there. Are you, are you speaking of, of, of this one? Yeah, that area there. That, Thanks for that, doing that. Yeah, that's <laughs> it. Exactly. Yeah. I, so, I don't want to do that. I want to get to that. No, that's perfect. That's what I would probably do. I used to do that with the laser pointer in the workshops when, you know, when we looked at slides. But, uh, but then you look at the other light and shadow areas of the other persimmons. And look at the edge quality there. And it's, they're beautiful edges, but there's a, there's a definite sort of dominance of which edge is more prominent in this piece. So she, she's always, always in command and where she's directing the viewer to go. And yet uh, the shape, the circle keeps you moving around, the branch moves you around. And then what I love, if you just look at the circular shapes, the oval shapes, mm -hmm. you take each one and you look at the turning of the persimmon, each shape has a uniqueness to it. You know, so carefully she's never, she's not, she's repeating shape, but not. You know, she's, she's doing a beautiful job of making each shape similar but different at the same time, which is hard to do, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I like the way the shadow mimics the actual branch you know the shape and direction of it for sure. oh yeah yeah that, i did i just noticed that now thanks for pointing it out chris yeah, yeah it's beautiful the way that brings you around yeah well, there, there's, you know, I, yeah there's a there's a lot of you know if you look there really is a lot of repetition there's 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 you know so it's it's it's, it's bringing you back around but you know if, if there's if there, you look at the reds and the oranges and, and even within the shadows and and you know these beautiful silver green tones i mean yeah you know, it's just, it, again, it, it's, it's a wonderful piece. Um, oh, yes. And, and uh, you know, congratulations to, to Mary, Terry McMurray. We're, we're really proud to have sponsored this uh, $1,000 cash prize. Uh, That's so fantastic. I, I, you know, I hope she enjoys it. And, and uh, we're, we're really ecstatic that, uh, that she won this, this piece. So oh, it, yeah. it, did you want, to, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. Was there anything, something else you want to mention about this piece? I, I, I just, just want, want to, to congratulate her, and, I, and I'm looking at the size again, 16. Well, that, that's right. I was going to ask you, what did you think now that you saw the size, which is a 16? Yeah, right? see, that, this is one of the things online that, you know, and maybe it was better that I didn't see the size, because, you know, when you're dropped during a live show, you do see them, the size, and, you know, it can or cannot have an impact. You know, I mean, I've, I've, shows where the smallest piece ended up being the grand prize because you know quality is quality whatever size but it it is fun to see the size now and I can kind of imagine what that would look like visually uh, you know in a, in a room and I I know it'll be online but I, I hope you post the sizes when you have the show up uh, oh yeah yes, for the yes. viewers the the uh, absolutely yeah the the uh, uh, just keep in mind to let people know this is actually being pre-recorded right um, right. So, so the show, the, the show is actually up right now. Oh, um, it is okay. Right. Yeah. And so this announcement will go right. It will, 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 so we're gonna we're gonna actually um, publish this video uh, in about a week. So uh, you know the, the winners will be announced on August eighth, uh, and uh, and this should be published uh, right after I do the announcement. So. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. That's fantastic. But, uh, well, it was it was uh, I, I think it was. Uh, one, we love your insight, Lorenzo. I mean, we Thank had, you. truly admire your, your work, your talent, your, Thank you. your years uh, um, that you've given to the pastel community and how many artists you've inspired along the way. Um, Thank you. That Appreciate is, that. Is, is a real gift, um, um, you know. Uh, and so uh, to be a, a teacher and to be a good one at that uh, takes 
takes, I would say, um, you know, is, 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 is a gift in itself. And, um, and, and so Thank you. Again, we, we certainly appreciate that. Um, if you have any closing words, uh, both you and Chris at this time, unless you want us to talk about any more pieces, uh, we're, we're about uh, a little over an hour in, but if you want to discuss any other pieces, uh, we're free to do that. Or uh, we can close uh, on this high point. Uh, sure, and, sure, and, yeah. uh, you know, so it's your call. What would you like to? Well, I, I think this is a really, like you said, it's a high point. I mean, congratulations. This is first place winner to Terry. I just want to congratulate all the award winners. Uh, and, but I want to congratulate everyone in the show. I mean, just that you're all brave. I appreciate you taking the time to submit to a show and, and taking that chance, you know, it's, it's not an easy thing to do, but I'm so happy that you all did it and, and continue, you know, striving for the best quality you can and, and go out and enjoy the show, go, go enjoy the show and study the works online. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, I, I wish you guys all the best out in California and this, this group, it's a fine group. This was a very, very fine exhibition. It was a tough cool. one to, to judge. And, and it just shows that there's tr tremendous quality being submitted for your exhibition. So kudos to you guys out there. Um, well, we, we, we certainly appreciate it. So you, you thank, you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The artist. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Chris, do you have any uh, closing words for uh, our judge, our jurors, uh, our, all I, our artists? I just want to say that, as it's already been said, I really appreciate um, the artists that entered. I appreciate the hard work the jurors did. And I definitely appreciate you, Lorenzo, and your insights were awesome. Your analogies, you. I love it. You know, it's Thank just, you. you did a great job. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you guys. Thank you. Appreciate, I, it's an honor to do this and uh, I really appreciate that. Oh. Uh, I, I would like to, if I may, um, for closing, uh, I, I want to acknowledge, um, again, our, our jurors, our international jurors, Isabel B. Lim. Diana Ponting and Neil O'Neill. Uh, Diana Ponting's from Canada, Neil O'Neill's from uh, Ireland. Uh, and oh. uh, so I, had, I mentioned he was in France, he was from France, but you know, because he, he's back and forth from France and Ireland so much, but he actually wow. resides in, 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 uh, in Ireland. Um, I want to thank um, all our sponsors, uh, Holbein, Richardson Art, Dakota Art Pastels, uh, Armadillo Art uh, and, and Craft. Um, uh, Red Rock Pastel Society uh, for sponsoring a prize. Art Spectrum, uh, I think, uh, if I didn't mention them, Art Spectrum, thank you very much. Uh, UART, um, and if I'm missing anyone, I'll be sure to post it on our website where you can visit us at pssewebsite.org. We have uh, links to um, uh, the shows, uh, to our, uh, our next coming up, uh, our shows coming up, our next exhibitions, but any exhibition that you, that you missed, uh, you can see the award winners by going onto our website. Uh, again, that is pssewebsite.org. Uh, we'd love for you to visit us, or if you'd like to be part of us, our society, we'd love to have you. So again, thank you to all the artists who uh, entered the show. It's a beautiful, beautiful stunning show. And to Lorenzo uh, for giving us your expertise, your time, and, and your, your wonderful knowledge. So thank you very, very much uh, for being our judge this year. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. With that, we say goodbye and uh, enjoy uh, enjoy your prizes. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you, guys.